Tell me about sort of your first love, which I think is science fiction. Yes, absolutely. My first love was very definitely science fiction. Yeah, I mean, that was, it was not only, you know, my first love in the book business, but also my first opportunity in the book business. Um, you know, I sort of lucked into a situation where I was a, an assistant at Bantam Books. Um, and Bantam was the top paperback book publisher in the world at, at the time. And they were great at everything except publishing science fiction. They had, they had some impressive titles on their list, but for the most part, they didn't have a real publishing program. And I just sort of took a flyer and, and you know, convinced the executive team there to let me try to put a science fiction publishing program together. And they said, yes. I think, they, I think what they really said was, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, what, what, how, how bad could it be? And, 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 uh, and so they let me do it. And, and it turned out to be a program that is now, you know, a, an imprint that's been running for 30 plus years. And you got to write the Star Wars books, or at least the... the well, I didn't write the Star Wars books. I wish yeah. I'd written them. No, I, 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 um, I, was, I, I was able to convince Lucas to, Lucasfilm to allow books to be written in their universe. That that was uh, that was a, a big breakthrough for them because they had um, they had actually I mean George Lucas had just de decided not to do more movies um, that was after the, the original trilogy came out and the product and the and the property was just kind of you know laying fallow and I wrote them a letter and and said you know look if you're not going to do anything with this yeah th this is the most beloved science fiction universe ever you know let me do books. Uh, and a year later, they got back to me and said, "Yeah, that's not a bad idea." Um, and yeah, and that that that's the the Star Wars extended universe that that uh, you know, that sort of reinvigorated the whole the whole program. So tell me about again, because I think it's a good way in in terms of like what what are the trends in science fiction? I mean, you obviously publish science fiction and you write science fiction. So tell me about like. Well, what do we see? How has science fiction changed? I mean, partly because science fiction is, in certain respects, no longer science fiction. Well, sure, and I, but I think that that's always been it's always been one of the challenges for 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 science fiction writers is to deal with the fact that they're um, you know that they're outmoding themselves um, and to reinvent because of that. I think the thing that that's happened, and and this is not really new anymore, but it's it's the it's the most significant trend that I've I've seen in the last decade is that the focus is much more on the, the effect of technology on people rather than on the technology itself. You know, in, in the, you know, in the early days of science fiction, it was all about ideas and machines and, and that sort of thing. And now it's very much more about who, who is affected by all of this and how they're affected and what they do when they're affected by it. You know about character driven, and there are writer a writer named John Scalzi who publishes for somebody else does a tr tremendous job of of capturing the the human component. Um, you know writers like Neil Stevenson and and uh, and uh, William Gibson have always written books that are at least as focused about characters as uh, as they are on uh, on the tech that's behind it. Giving the characters very sort of almost some of the the drama the conflict is one that is very present or is very um commonplace i guess i mean i'm, I'm trying to it, yeah and and also relatable i think you know the the thing I, I think you know science fiction does two things really well if, if a really good science fiction writer is doing two two things well at the same time they're extrapolating and and putting new thoughts in our heads but they're also writing it in such a way that we can actually relate to it about things that we're experiencing now and showing us what that experience might be like in some other way um, and therefore allowing us to reflect on that experience for ourselves. That kind of storytelling is, is especially rich at the moment. I was having a conversation with a writer this morning where I was trying to advise him to, uh, to avoid focusing too much on issues like the pandemic because in a science fiction story, um, be, because I think it, we're going to be overwhelmed by those. The, the, there are going to be hundreds of them coming out in the next 18 months. 
and that is a movement away. I think what was happening was there was for a long time dystopian scenarios were the only scenario that was, scenarios that were working, um, and then it did start to to evolve out of that a little bit. Now I would guess that the dystopian scenarios are coming back. Well, it's, it's the easy choice. I mean, look. I mean, yes. I think part of it, as I as I've thought about it, and you'll have a better sense of this. It's look. An easy choice is to play on people's fears and nightmares rather than their hopes and dreams. I think. I think it's in a way a more um, gripping your seat. I mean, in my world, certainly, than than sort of trying to project a, a future that has a different set of dramas or. or, or, right. or I mean, look. It's always interesting to see something that is is taking something and doing something different than what everybody else is doing. But can people pull that off is the question. But give me a sort of a sense of what your, you know, as people were moving towards a more um, or a less dystopian place. And, and, and are, you, do you think there are stories that are going to get told that, I guess, defy these, these, this, the, these terms? Because that would be very interesting. Oh, I think so. I think no question about it. I think that that's always been true. I mean, there were, you know, there were always writers like Ray Bradbury who were imagining a, you know, a, a, a more, you know, a, a saner, sweeter world. Um, you know, it, while lots of other people were, were, you know, telling darker tales. And actually, a lot of a lot of the the great old science fiction writers actually were super op optimistic, even even if they didn't, they weren't particularly good at. At capturing it from a human perspective, that I think there'll be an over. It, what always happens, you know, for example, in the in the in the thriller category, you know, when you know when you know after nine eleven there was an, an overwhelming number of you know of terrorist novels that that were published. It's an easy choice, and there's an easy enough audience to reach with that choice. So lots of people go with it. That's what we'll we'll see with pandemic stories and and you know and you know near future dystopian you know worlds you know strafed by viruses kind of, you know stories and that sort of thing but then there will be writers who come on the other side of that who um, or in, in the midst of it uh, with something more human more optimistic more instructive in terms of our ability to battle through things you know it, it's an interesting thing because all entertainment industries are sort of facing this at, at the same time that the, the traditional mechanics for reaching an audience have changed so completely that it is now the producer's role, you know, or the publisher's role or whatever, you know, or the distributor's role, depending on where, where one is in the chain, to, to find the individual consumer as opposed to a mass of consumers, which was what the film industry and the book industry and, and the theater industry and all of those were much better at. And the, the tools that they used for finding masses of audiences led to this notion that hybrids were a problem or that, that, um, that, that you needed a pithy log line and that sort of thing in order to to reach an audience. Most audiences, I mean, most people I know, certainly, don't enjoy one kind of entertainment. I know very few people who, who say, I, I only watch mystery shows, you know, or I only read parenting books or, or, or that, that sort of thing. Most people have many touch points in, in their interests. And, and so, you know, a, a film like this that can touch people in, in multiple ways isn't a liability, except if you're trying to make broad marketing statements. And, and I think, you know, what, certainly what I'm seeing in, in the book world, and I think um, is, is sort of critical for all marketers now, of entertainment at least, um, is, is that you find the, the piece of what you're presenting that aligns well with a specific slice of an audience. And you present it to that audience in that way. And then you present it to a different audience in, in another way and a different audience to another way. And the reason why that can work is because people don't have 
one kind of interest. So if, if you're reaching out to people who are, are known to be science fiction fans, they're probably going to also be interested in the human drama that, that, that is in the film. Uh, you know, they're, they're also likely to be interested in sort of the, the sociological issues that, that are, are being raised in the film. Um, so you're selling it to them as a work of futurism or a work of science fiction or however, you know, you're playing it for, for that particular audience, but they're responding to the whole thing. The way to, in my opinion, the way to, uh, to navigate through those expectations is, is, is not to, to, to run from any description because I do think that makes it, I think that, that causes too many people to say, then I'm just not going to, you know, if I don't know what I'm getting into, I'm not going to get into it at all, but rather to, to highlight the distinctive nature. Because you know, I think I think there are plenty of people. Look, there are plenty of people who want nothing more than to be taken exactly where they were hoping to go for two hours. Yes. But I think there's a very substantial audience of people who who you know would love to, uh, to who are looking for freshness. They're looking for something, uh, looking for a story that's being presented to them in a way that they haven't seen it before and might only be turned off if they didn't know that that was what they were getting. A huge audience for something that's very conventional. And I think there's a sizable audience for things that, for projects that take chances. I think there's very little audience, very little audience for something that is a little outside of the box. You know, a little outside of the box just means that the people who want way outside of the box are not gonna be satisfied in any way. And the people who are in the box are, are just going to be freaked out by the by the, the the fact that there's some unusual stuff in here. So I think being audacious is is really the only legitimate play. And we're living in such a bizarre world where unpublishable. Yeah. I mean that's a fact. I mean that has to be a real factor because you know before some of these things were relegated to fantasy or to you know absurdist satire. I mean, but it's not anymore. I mean, this has to also play out in our creativity. Yeah, that's an that's an interesting question, but I, I do think yeah, well, the future of satire has completely uh, has, 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 is on a completely altered course because of, of what's happening in, in real time now. What's incumbent upon on storytellers is to posit scenarios that are different from the scenarios that we're looking at all the time now. You know, and I think that, and that's always been true for storytellers, but I think it's, it's become, it, the, the job has become a different job because of the world that we're living in. You know, we just have to accept that there's, you know, there's a whole different set of scenarios that we have to allow ourselves to play out. Because if, if we don't um, allow ourselves to think audaciously, to think optimistically, to, 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 think our way out of problems you know we don't have a role anymore as as storytellers we just don't have a role it you know because if all if all we're doing is is reflecting what what exists now what the our, our current condition that's happening that's happening 24 7 on you know uh, you know on cable networks uh, you know, and and on the internet you know as, as you were talking, I was thinking about the idea of nemesis is and you know, in, in terms of their relationship with protagonists and so on. And mm -hmm. I, I wonder how people are going to sort of nuance their villains or just go full up, full hog. And that's going to be OK because we've had them. I mean, I, you know, it does. It is interesting. Well, you know, it, it's funny. It, it's an interesting thing to consider because I think in the fiction world, the, there was a, a very strong movement away from from any kind of villain that felt stereotyped at all, except in certain kinds of, you know, rah-rah, you know, thriller fiction or that sort of thing. But um, most really successful writers of novels of conflict had become, um, you know, fairly adept at, at nuancing their, their, their villains. Because what they found was that, you know, that readers weren't responding to the, uh, the mustache, mustache uh, twirling uh, villain anymore, or you know, you know, or the, you know, 
you know, the, the cliched Arab villain or, you know, the cliched Russian villain or, or that, that sort of thing. Um, I think what stuns so many writers in watching what's playing out now is that the, the, what, what we're seeing on the news is, is stuff that we would, we would have rejected as, as a choice for, 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 a, fit, for a novel because it, it, of how preposterously, you know, cliched it is and how transparent it is. You know, I, I think, I, I would guess that, um, that storytellers are going to double down on nuancing their characters, that they're not going to, they're, they're going to resist the urge to turn them all into uh, pick your populist leader. <laughs> I, I think what uniquely opt optimistic about this condition is that it's given everybody some extra time to think and some extra time to appreciate what they had and to imagine a better way to play this out going forward. You know, the first several weeks after the lockdown, um, there was an enormous run on films like Contagion and, uh, and Virus and, and that sort of thing. But now that's sort of, uh, uh, you know, I think the, the second wave is, is hitting. I think this is probably ready for the third wave. Yeah, you know, the second wave is mindless entertainment. It's just really just, I, I, I just want to laugh, you know, or I just want to watch a love story or, or whatever it is, or I just want to watch lots of spaceships or that, that kind of thing. But I think that the wave that comes beyond that will be, I want something that, that suggests to me that there's some really good stuff happening in the future.